You know that feeling you get when you've been driving a car for a long time and you pull in for gas, not realizing how dirty your windshield is, and the guy cleans your windshield and you go, oh my God, look how clear the world is. That's kind of what neurofeedback feels like. Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 178th episode of this podcast dedicated to anything and everything that you can do to help the inner workings of your own brain, or even in some cases to allow well-intentioned experts armed with the latest technical gadgetry to do the same. In this episode, we're going to look at a couple of technologies which are being used increasingly in therapies, virtual reality, neurofeedback, quantitative electroencephalograms, and more, how all of these pieces can start to fit together, and also how some of these technologies that have been cost prohibitive for things outside of a therapeutic realm until recently are really starting to make it down into the consumer sphere in ways that aren't just toy technologies. We're going to be talking with one academic researcher, Dr. Eva Zisk, and a practitioner, Dr. Robert Reiner, who we've spoken with on a previous episode, both of those coming up as interwoven conversations in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I'm going to tell you about some of the latest research on elephants. You might be wondering how this has bearing on you, but even if you are not the proud owner of a pet elephant, you certainly sleep, and some recent studies into elephant sleep might shed some light on why mammals sleep at all. That'll be in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, but as usual, let's kick things off first with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. When Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species, there was, of course, a lot of furor. There still is a lot of furor and people saying, no way, that couldn't possibly be true. But one of his scientific contemporaries, whose name I unfortunately don't remember, his response was essentially, oh my God, how did we not see that for all this time? And a study published just recently in the April 20th edition of Current Biology has a somewhat similar forehead slappingness to it in some of the directions that it's pointing, looking at the way that the brain is organized as far as driving muscular action. So if you remember a homunculus, what that concept is, sometimes you'll see this distorted little figure that has giant lips and giant hands and fingertips and huge genitals. And it's basically taking a human body and enlarging or reducing the proportions based on how many nerve endings there are in different regions. You obviously don't have as many nerve endings on your elbows as you do on your lips. And so the homunculus would have tiny little elbows and big old lips. And the standing assumption has been that at least in the motor cortex areas of the brain driving skeletal muscles, those portions of the brain have been divided up based on body parts. People seem to be pretty consistent in the way that this organization happens, although you'll sometimes see interesting things like if a person loses a limb in an accident, the portion of the brain that mapped onto the no longer existing limb can kind of get co-opted by other body parts that start moving in on that neural territory trying to make it useful for something. This sort of brain plasticity is well recognized, but there's also limits to it, especially in adults. Children have a lot more latitude, and they've actually done some interesting studies, although the ones that aren't terribly fun to think about in animals, things like sewing a baby kitten's eyelids shut so they can never open their eyes, and then seeing how the parts of their brain that would normally be devoted to vision get redistributed to other perceptual senses. But in a new study conducted between the University College London and the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel, they decided to look at congenitally one-handed people, people who were born without a hand rather than people who lost a hand in an accident, and seeing how their brains were organized. The researchers identified 17 people who lacked a hand from birth and had 24 people as matched two-handed controls. And then the participants were recorded on video while they were performing everyday tasks like wrapping a present, handling money, scratching their nose, basic stuff like that, and then seeing how they went about it. Participants were also asked to move various body parts. You can kind of imagine the fMRI version of a hokey pokey dance. So scientists could see individual by individual which body part matched up with which region within the brain, says Tamar Macon, one of the lead researchers. We found that the traditional hand area gets used up by a multitude of body parts in congenital one-handers. Interestingly, these body parts that get to benefit from increased representation in the freed up brain territory are those that are used by one-handers in daily life to substitute for their missing hand function. In people that are born with a normal complement of hands, a lot of these tasks would typically be handled by the non-dominant hand. But for people that are born with a missing hand, the one hand that they do have is their dominant hand by default. And depending on how much of their other hand or arm is missing, they might use different strategies on how they do these day-to-day tasks. 
what the fMRI findings seem to suggest is that the way that the brain gets organized in these cases is heavily based on which of the remaining body parts are actually used to perform the tasks that the non-dominant hand would be used for. So the standard assumption that the brain is organized into regional zones based on body parts is maybe completely wrong or just the wrong way of thinking about it, that we should instead be thinking about the brain's motor cortex as being divided up based on functional regions rather than structural regions in the body says Macon. The fact that we see such a striking different representation in that area in congenital one-handers might suggest that this is not actually the hand area. If true, this means we've been misrepresenting brain organization based on body part rather than based on function. It's kind of mind-blowing for me to think that we could have been getting this wrong for so long. She notes that this observation is just a working theory at this point, but her hope is to use these findings to find ways to encourage the brain to represent and control artificial body parts such as prosthetic arms. If we, as neuroscientists, could harness this process, we could really provide a powerful tool to better health care and society. Unfortunately, this process is currently quite restricted in the brains of adults, but by learning how this occurs spontaneously in one-handers, we can get a handle on what we might be able to achieve. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Picked up another nice bouquet of five-star reviews on iTunes this week. We've got a contest going on, which I, I hesitate to call a bribe, but it's dangerously close to the dictionary definition. Mentioned back on episode number 175 about sleep and light in the brain. We've got a couple of human chargers that we're giving away to randomly selected review leavers on iTunes that come in during the month of April. So if you hear this and it's still April, you've still got your chance for both details on that contest and details on what a human charger actually is should you not know. I direct you back to smartdrugsmarts.com slash 175. But a cool contest and not too late to enter, we'll announce the winners on next week's show. In any event, Dan Star 4 from the USA says simply, great podcast, good information, make your brain smarter. And College Geek, also from the USA, says, SDS is one of my favorite podcasts and is always full of life-enhancing tips I can actually apply. Thanks, and looking forward to many more episodes. Well, thank you both. Thanks to everybody who has been leaving reviews both before and after this contest. It appeases the algorithm at iTunes, helps them like us better, exposes new people to the podcast, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. I am a big believer that a smarter world is a better world. That's a theme which is probably too long to riff on right now, but if I had a core political tenet, that would probably be it. Smart Road Smarts has a newsletter. We call that the Brain Breakfast. It sends out weekly or so. It actually would have been out a couple of days ago, except this week's edition is referencing an episode that we had a couple of weeks ago, 176, with Dr. David Nichols, in which we talk about taboo subjects like LSD. Apparently, the all caps letters LSD in the email that we were prepping to send from our email service set off some sort of tripwire, and we had to justify with their internal lawyers why this was an email worthy of sending. I think I talked them down off the ledge yesterday. Everything's fine now. But anyway, the brain breakfast a few days late, but for interesting, non-technical, purely bureaucratic reasons. If you have not yet signed up for the Brain Breakfast, you can do so at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. Far less controversial than LSD and also much easier to buy online are our stacks Nexus and Mitogen, which you can find over at axonlabs.io. Axon Labs is the retail arm of goings on here at Smart Drug Smarts, where in two products we capture 10 cognitive enhancing ingredients, including solbutyamine, aniracetam, CDP choline, pycnogenol, and more. You can consolidate some space in your vitamin shelf or get your vitamin shelf off to a good start if you're not there yet by visiting axonlabs.io. That's all the news, so let's jump ahead now to these interviews. Smart Drug Smarts. So in the coming interview, I'm going to be speaking with two different experts, each of whom are dealing with the uses of technology for therapeutics and psychology. Dr. Robert Reiner from Behavioral Associates in New York. He specializes in quantitative behavioral therapy, neurofeedback, and the uses of VR technologies in dealing with people's fears. We spoke with him almost 100 episodes ago, back in episode number 87, dusting off some of those same topics, but also updating things a bit based on how even in the past year, the advances in technology have changed things in his therapeutic practice. And Dr. Eva Zisk, who is a senior lecturer at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. She's doing research work into the potential uses of virtual reality technologies into dealing with social anxiety disorder, which at this point the question seems to be becoming not could this be useful, but how can it be most useful? She'll be talking about her work still under research right now, but what some of the broader applications might be as this technology makes it out into the wild. We'll also talk a little about what some of the future might hold as these technologies get more and more integrated into our everyday life and how the therapeutic value might change as the novelty factor diminishes. But with no further ado, let's jump in with Drs. Robert Reiner and Eva Zisk. 
So this is quite different. If you've never experienced virtual reality, it's not like looking at a screen and having it the way you might picture 3D. It has a very, very high aspect of something we call presence, which is actually like you really feel like you're in that room. Someone could be standing next to you and talking to you, but you still feel like they're right next to you in that particular room. So it's really, really quite a cool effect. And what we can do with that is we can actually manipulate the things that we want to. So for example, we can have, let's say, a virtual audience and we can have the person choose, for instance, or the therapist choose whether the audience is small, medium or large. And importantly, whether the audience is reacting positively, neutrally, or negatively, depending on the level of exposure the person wishes to have. And this is exactly the kind of crux of the sort of virtual reality exposure therapy that we are investigating right now. It's not always going to be a perfectly positive response from the audience. Somebody might be a heckler or a booer in the virtual audience if somebody's fairly far along in their process. Yeah, exactly. So we're not as far along with the little intricacies of it. So right now we've got kind of three levels over five domains that people can change. But as we kind of go through it, yeah, this whole dialing up or dialing down would be a great sort of way to do it. But in terms of the actual testing of it, we first need to be able to see does having a negative versus neutral versus positive response as a kind of a three group comparison. Does that help, for instance? One thing that might be worth talking about a little bit is just breaking apart the terms virtual reality versus augmented reality. I think those are probably used a bit interchangeably these days, and maybe we should specify what's going on there. Big difference. Virtual reality completely seals you off. Complete reconstruction. You put these glasses on and you don't want outside light to come in because that reduces the immersiveness of it. So you're entirely enclosed. In augmented reality, you see the world through a lens, but you can put windows windows in there. A lot of architects like to use it because people can design a room. You say, how's this couch going to look over here in an empty room? And you slide a couch in. So that's augmented reality. It's, I think, in a lot of ways more realistic because it's not as isolating as virtual reality incredible how it's so much more well known right now and when we tell people we've been doing it since 1999 they're amazed they, they thought it was just invented two years ago because facebook bought oculus the systems have gotten much better now with cell phone technology it changed everything in virtual reality that's the biggest change that i've seen the fact that you can plug a cell phone into an oculus shell whoever thought about that first thought that up it was a brilliant idea to use the gyroscope because that's the most important and the most expensive piece of a virtual reality program is the gyroscope. But every cell phone has a video camera requires a gyroscope. I remember when I was interviewed probably 10 years ago when the iPhone came out about the growth of apps. We're seeing a similar explosion right now with virtual reality. I heard a news report this morning about it that a big problem has been people on subway platforms or train stations bumping into other people. People forget that they're completely in a different world. I'm hoping that that's augmented reality if somebody's on a platform for a subway rather than full VR, but maybe not. That's exactly what I thought. Maybe not is right. These people are either misinformed or they think that they know the platform very well and they don't. And that's a good example of how virtual reality really does change your judgment. But there's a very good reason, for example, you ever wonder why if light travels so much quicker than sound, they still use a starting pistol to start a race and not a flash of light? And I was puzzled by it until I, I did some research. I found out that, yeah, it is true. But once information gets into our senses, our ears are so much quicker. Our brain is picking up what's coming into our ears much quicker, almost instantaneously, whereas our eyes are relatively slow. Now, they can't even use a starting pistol inside the ring because the person who is on the inside lane has the advantage of a few microseconds. So they have it behind them right now. So incoming signals from those two senses, sight versus hearing, we're going to respond more quickly to a sound impulse versus a light impulse. I mean, there's not really a comparison there. Not even close. That's right. There was a famous case of a guy who was blinded when he was about eight years old, and he loved skiing. Actually, he learned how to ski picking up sound waves, the way a bat does. So he got really good at it, and when he was about 50, they had this surgery that was going to restore his eyesight, and they did. And when they first took off the bandages, all you saw were these weird lights you couldn't figure out. He couldn't even recognize his children. It took him a while for the brain to catch up. We take this stuff for granted. We think the world is what we see, but it's not. It's our brain's interpretation of it. 
So one of the things we'd like to do with our virtual reality therapy app that we've got developed and we're continuing to kind of hone is actually see if we can apply this to youth who struggle with social anxiety. So while we haven't actually tested this in a young sample population, we have been testing it in university students and we can already see that it works. And what is the current standard of care for people that are dealing with severe anxiety issues? Probably what is mostly recommended for people that struggle with social anxiety disorder is something called CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's the type of treatment which has been most researched, and we know that it works. So a lot of the time, it's quite difficult to do research about which treatment works best, because just the way that research works, you put multiple treatments side by side, well, they might all work to a really kind of good extent. And to be able to find meaningful differences between them. It's quite difficult if you don't have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people, which we don't normally do clinical trials on that many, at least in the early stages. But CBT, we know, is much better than weightless control. And we know it is actually better than other treatments. The concept, why it's so effective, is you know that image, if you look at a face at a particular angle, it's Marilyn Monroe. At a different angle, it's Albert Einstein. Do you ever wonder why you can't see in the middle and see the one or the other? The reason it has to do with our brains and how our brains organize our perception of reality. Think about our brains. We've got this two, three pound piece of meat, basically biological wetware, is sitting in our skull that has no contact ever with the outside world and, and relies solely on our senses. That's why if you get hit in the back of the head, you'll see stars because you've activated the occipital lobe, which is the vision center. And we'll talk about reality versus virtual reality. That's a misnomer because all reality is virtual reality. It's the way our brain interprets light bouncing off objects in the world. Unfortunately for social anxiety disorders specifically, it's actually very, very difficult using a CBT approach at times Because, first of all, over 80% of people with social anxiety disorder don't actually receive treatment, so they might refuse that treatment. And one underlying reason for that might be because of the specific nature of the actual fear, which is a fear of interacting with other people and also being judged by other people as well. But actually, we've also found that, not myself, my research group, but just in general, researchers have found that people tend to seek treatment only after about 15 to 20 years of having symptoms. So now we're looking at people who have really had this for a very, very long time. So this is a bit of a problem with CBT, we think, is because obviously it does have that one-on-one component. And people also know that CBT incorporates two things. One is the person works with a therapist to kind of modify their thoughts and beliefs. So potentially looking at why they might be feeling like they're being judged and actually doing some behavioral experiments about are people actually judging them? Are they actually negatively evaluating them? And then the other component, and this is the part which can be a little bit tricky, is that people with uh, social anxiety disorder or any other kind of anxiety disorder would be working with a therapist to do kind of repeated exposure trials. Let's just say a very simple analogy is people with spider phobia. They might first be exposed to a picture of a spider and then maybe play with plastic spider and then maybe watch a little spider walking around, then maybe handle that spider and then the spider might get bigger. So this is quite similar with social anxiety and exposure therapy for that, where people would be placed in social situations to be able to see that nothing bad happens. And over time, their anxiety would just go down because we, as our bodies, we can't sustain a high state of anxiety for a long, long period of time. However, the problem with that is we can't actually control, we can't influence what happens on the other side of that. So we can put people in these situations, but we can't guarantee the patient that others won't judge them or that others won't react negatively to them, which can be obviously a little bit of a problem if it does happen that way and then that can actually confirm the person's original fear. So this is where virtual reality exposure therapy can be very, very useful, where we can actually simulate a social environment through having people be immersed in kind of a virtual world. Have you had equal levels of success with most people with virtual reality therapy, or are there some people that for some reason they don't buy into it or it doesn't feel real enough to them? So one is something called presence, and we do find that virtual reality tends to have very high presence, and this is kind of across all age groups. 
what can people do with it afterwards? So basically, are the benefits just in the actual virtual reality environment? So yes, they might decrease over time in terms of their social anxiety whilst they might be doing a public speech in a virtual reality environment. But does that actually translate to the real world? And so that's the kind of follow up questions that we'll need to be asking in our upcoming study anyways. So we'll be able to get those answers to you as soon as we know. But offhand quotes just from students emailing us and saying, you know, this has really worked. This has really helped with my assessment for one one student who had an assessment that was an oral presentation just after. So it is very heartening and we think it might translate, but we do need to uh, be able to test that. There are other people getting treated with virtual reality for things like post-traumatic stress disorder, which can affect people of all ages. And you're asking, do people buy into it? Well, some age groups might do more so than others, but also because a lot of the time it's still in kind of getting tested phases, we're only going to be attracting patients or participants who are actually interested in having VR intervention to begin with. So we don't know if we roll it out in the UK, for instance, the NHS, if it's going to attract all sorts of people. But it does give people who are interested in it that kind of a tool. And it might particularly engage people that might actually be quite difficult to engage in the first instance, such as young people. So youth and and university students and uh, people of kind of a younger age group. Tell me in the last couple of years, some of the protocol changes that you've been able to make to your therapeutic practice based on these new technologies. With neurofeedback, for example, we're able now to give people home practice devices. In ADD cases, they're producing too many slow theta waves and not enough beta waves. Beta waves are required when we concentrate. If you want to do an interesting experiment on this, if you put your thumb on your carotid artery, that's the artery going to your brain, and you take your pulse, and then you do some complex math, you know, start subtracting seven from a thousand, you'll notice your pulse increases to the brain because the brain requires blood. The brain is an incredible organ, but it does require 20 to 25 percent of all blood. And even then, you can tell what part of the brain a person is using by where the blood is. Let's say uh, we're dealing with somebody with ADD that has trouble concentrating, and we're giving them neurofeedback to try to produce more beta waves, and we're having them suppress theta waves. The beta-theta ratio is very important. Well, back in the old days, all we could do was either offer them stimulant medication or neurofeedback, but there are home devices now that can be used. There's an excellent app in the Android world called Brainwaves that produces a audio signal that causes your brain to move into that area, meaning you'll flood it with beta waves. The human brain is a copy machine, basically, in a lot of ways. If you send in audio or visual frequency at, say, 16 hertz, which is the beta range, those waves begin to dominate in the human brain. So we now have the ability for an app that doesn't cost any money at all to alter brain waves. And we can confirm this with a neurofeedback device. I'll put an EEG scanner on my own head and put headphones on. And sure enough, those waves begin to dominate. And they've got some interesting technologies that essentially can hide those frequency fluctuations in music and things like that. So it doesn't sound like you're just listening to a sine wave either. They're called entrainment devices right now, and they're commercially available. You put on glasses and you headphones and you'll get flashing lights at a particular frequency and sound to match it. But you can embed the sound in music that you like. You can now, when for neurofeedback, watch a movie. And kids really love this because they don't even know they're being trained. When your brain goes to the right spot, the movie gets bigger and brighter and dominates the screen. When your brain goes into a place that's undesirable, like producing theta waves in ADD, the movie gets smaller. So kids get to pick out their own movie and it works just as well. I'm wondering about the correlation, if any, between introversion and extroversion and social anxiety disorder. Intuitively, it seems like it would be the introverted people that are going to have social anxiety problems. But is that always the case? Are there such things as extroverts that have social anxiety issues? No, it's quite a complex thing. So it's very hard to almost have these kind of blanket statements of any sort, which does make it quite interesting for us as research to research, to look into. There's some of the research that we're doing, we've got one part of it where we're looking at predictors of social anxiety. And while we're not quite looking at introversion, extroversion, we know that introversion does predict social anxiety, but that doesn't mean that one equals one. So if one person has it, that means that they automatically will have this or not have that. So there are 
other elements to it. So for instance, having a lot of maybe social support can allow introverts who might have had social anxiety to some extent, maybe not develop the disorder. There might be, as you were saying, extroverts who might actually just be very good at covering up their social anxiety, or they might have social anxiety, but in other areas. So for instance, eating in public, writing in public, things that they can actually hide, but they might be fairly good at giving presentations or having one-on-one discussions. And so we can't always say that extroverts don't necessarily have it because that isn't always the case. Since there's different modalities that a person could use to do brain entrainment, let's say that you're doing this with audio. Does that start in the audio portions of the brain and kind of percolate out from there, or does it hit the whole thing simultaneously? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I think next time I put a EEG scanner on, I'll be able to check. But there are other devices that we use at home right now because it turns out that that entrainment device I'm talking about, there's another way to do it with glasses that you can see through. So this was initially used for golfers. You know, one of the enemies of any golfer is the yips when you putt. We all know, you know, for a big pot, you get a little shaky and you're not quite as confident. Well, your brainwave actually changes. So you can send in the proper brainwaves to practice while you're putting. We talked about before augmented reality and virtual reality. Well, now in trainment, you can actually see the world. That is a big break. So kids can do neurofeedback and get a little bit of a boost by doing entrainment at the same time. It's really interesting to think about performance enhancing drugs and things that are illegal in the Olympics and baseball, but like we could be using light as a performance enhancing drug, things like that, that don't fall into our normal definitional categories. Actually, the 2008 Canadian Winter Hockey, they won the Olympics that year, I believe, they got the gold. They were trained in neurofeedback. The company that we buy our biofeedback from donated a bunch of equipment and they were trained to produce rapidly changing neurological states, which is very good for a hockey player. Can't say for sure that made them win the Olympics, but it seemed to hurt them. Yeah. And there's lots of applications, things in real life that nobody would think to consider it cheating, basically, unless it's for a competitive sport type scenario. You know, you just made a really good point, which is why is it that taking a chemical is called cheating, but having light or sound come in is not? But that's our culture. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of armchair referees out there that enjoy that sport quite a bit as well. I think it's probably more likely that more things will be considered cheating rather than less. I mean, what if the neurofeedback gets so good that there's a marked difference between people that are using it, as there is with drugs, for example? We know if if you give somebody Ritalin, anybody, they're going to perform better. Baseball players used to use it in the 70s. They called them greenies. The only reason there was not a lot of attention given to them and there was no punishment was because it didn't improve performance that much. It made you a little more alert, but we didn't see 75 home runs being hit. Would you say that social anxiety disorder is is something where we're failing really at the educational level for kids? You know, that we should be identifying kids earlier that, hey, this kid doesn't like speaking in front of their peer group rather than waiting until it's 20 years down the road and somebody has to seek out a psychologist for themselves? Yeah, so in a way, CBT usually kind of looks at the symptoms right then and there. And this is anxiety disorders generally that I'm speaking about now, that it actually doesn't even matter how long you've had some anxiety disorders, that you can still be very, very successful with your CBT if you just address the current symptoms you have. But actually, we do kind of know that the longer someone has a disorder, the more likely they are to even do things like hide some of their symptoms or not even realize that some of their symptoms are symptoms of the disorder if they actually think that it's part of their personality or their characteristics. So nowadays, we are more looking at early interventions. So in the UK, for instance, there's been a huge drive to be able to identify and treat people very, very early on. So sometimes even at the point before something gets to a clinical disorder. And so this is one of the reasons why having interventions that aren't necessarily like CBT. So in the UK, we've got the NHS, which is the National Healthcare Service. And basically what that does does is it allows mental health treatment and physical treatment as well for free to the UK public. But it's very, very costly on the taxpayers. So now we're kind of looking at it as, well, what can we do before that, before we need to send patients to receive cognitive behavioral therapy by therapists, whether they be clinical psychologists or IAPT practitioners, which is this new initiative by the government, which is improving access to psychological therapies. What if we do that earlier on? So as you're saying, what if we identify this in 
children and young people before it gets to be a diagnosable problem. And this is some of the conferences and things that are happening right now is the kind of what can we do and how well would it work and what are the long term effects of this? So we've talked a little bit about entrainment glasses and the devices that I I assume would have been cost prohibitive to send home with people previously, but now at home devices for therapy are becoming a reality. What other changes are you seeing? This is not neurofeedback as much as general biofeedback called heart rate variability. Turns out that if you put a strain gauger in the diaphragm, you can measure respiration. And this is basically a polygraph or lie detector. There's no direct human expression of lying. The device is measuring three things, heart rate, respiration rate and something called galvanic skin resistance or GSR, which you put electrodes on the fingertips and long before you actually perspire, tiny amounts of fluid are released under the pads of your fingers. Well, because fluid is a better conductor of electricity than skin tissue, the change in resistance is picked up and amplified directly by a computer. So we can tell when someone is a little bit anxious about something. And sure enough, this thing is sensitive to thoughts to produce anxiety. The problem is, and this is why lie detect should not be admissible in court, is that the very people who are most likely to commit crimes, psychopaths, have no guilt at all about the stuff they do. And in fact, very often they believe the lies. So they're going to beat a polygraph every time. Turns out with heart rate variability, when you get into phase between your respiration and your heart rate, let me explain what that means. If you ask people to take about five seconds to breathe in and five seconds to breathe out, that's about six breaths per minute, which is not a normal way to breathe. It's not recommended that you do this all the time, you'd faint. But if you do it for, say, 10 or 15 minutes, after about five minutes, something really interesting happens. Your heart rate begins to rise when you inhale and drop when you exhale. So you're getting sympathetic arousal. You know, the on system goes on when you inhale and the parasympathetic system, which is the relaxing system, drops when you exhale. Are those two systems normally associated with inhalation and exhalation or does that sync up only happen at this rhythmic breathing? I think it's much more pronounced. I don't think each time you breathe in and out, you activate sympathetic and parasympathetic arousal. I think it has to be slow, deliberate diaphragmatic breathing. That's my understanding of it. Say your resting pulse is 70 and it climbs to 90 when you inhale and it, it drops down to 60 when you exhale. You've got a 30 point swing. But let's say at six and a half breaths a minute, you get a 38 point swing. And that's the biggest one you can get. Well, we call that the person's sweet spot. We're going to train him at six and a half breaths a minute. And every smartphone has a voice recorder now. So I'll custom make a breathing exercise for these at the exact rate we determine the sweet spot to be so they can practice this at home whenever they want. And that puts you, it's a drug-like state. You feel like you've been injected I am with Valium, which is why we use it for sleep problems. And we strongly recommend that people never do it when they're driving a car because it does make you very sleepy. But it also causes very deep relaxation by suppressing the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. It's extremely relaxing. It temporarily disables fight or flight activity. So it's impossible to get anxious when you're doing this. If this is so effective with five to 10 minutes of calming people down, why is everybody not doing this before they go to bed every night? I mean, it seems like this would be a relatively easy thing to figure out for any given person and kind of put yourself in a really mellow state before you go to sleep. That's a very good question. I think a lot of people don't know about it. I also think that unfortunately in Western culture, people, the first thing they think about is take a pill. So that's what people do. But we're pushing this stuff hard. Certainly all of my patients know about it. How many people talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist professionally in their lifetime. Just a fraction. You've probably got every person who's in psychotherapy, you've got 100 people taking medications. It's the nature of our culture and it's reinforced by the pharmaceutical industry. That's why the drug companies are encouraging physicians like gynecologists and internal medicine people to prescribe psychotropic medication. Without much training, it's a concern. Is there anything that would be the contrapositive of that? Maybe hyperventilating might be the answer, but like to get yourself into an aroused state with a certain style of breathing? Well, you can want to get yourself anxious. I wouldn't call it aroused, though. I would call it, if you hyperventilate, it really advances sympathetic arousal. So you will you may not induce a panic attack, but you're going to feel very jittery. We do that very often in the office to demonstrate GSR, the idea that you can ramp up your anxiety level or sympathetic arousal by hyperventilating. It's the opposite of what we're doing with heart rate variability. So the answer to your question is yes, you can make yourself anxious or aroused that way. Yep. 
the anxious or aroused state, would that be the opposite as far as the heart rate variability? Would you see those two numbers come together where your inhalation and the exhalation, you essentially have the same heart rate? Well, it's very choppy. Contrary to popular belief, your heart rate, if your resting pulse is 72, it's not going to stay that way all day long. That's a good measure of cardiovascular health. The more variable your heart rate is, the more flexible your arteries are. Think about a garden hose that's sat all summer long. By the end of the summer, it's not very flexible. Our arteries are the same way. You know, we get older, they're not very flexible. If you see not a lot of heart rate variability in a person, it means one of two things. Either they're very old or they've got cardiovascular disease. Where would you like to see the technology continue to develop? What do you expect might be possible as either the technology gets better or maybe the price comes down and these tools become more available? The ideal outcome for this would be to do something like use it on a wait list control. So when people first enter the treatment system, they'd have to wait quite a few weeks before they would actually receive the system. So while they wait, they can actually do something to be able to help themselves. And this is part of this kind of self-help initiative. So that would be ideal. But for some people, they might not actually need to receive full-blown quote-unquote treatment. So potentially, it might just be something like a little bit of exposure that they can work on themselves, even through ways such as gamification, which is becoming quite popular, which is making things like therapy and actually making it quite fun so people can move through levels at their own speed. So this could be a standalone treatment, this virtual reality exposure therapy, or it can be as something that's supplemental to therapy or even as homework assignments. So CBT is based quite heavily around setting homework in between sessions and patients can actually do that in order to improve their outcomes and have this exposure in between sessions as well. Given the assumption that things continue to get cheaper and semi-predictable advances in technology, what do you see yourself as doing differently likely in five years from now versus what you're doing now? Well, I think the database will get much better for neurofeedback. The database we're using now It's only been around for about 10 years. It's very expensive to make a database, but when they do get better, I think it will make it so that people reach their goals much quicker. You know, right now we use something called a quantitative electroencephalogram or QEEG to quote, diagnose the problem, to see where the deficits are. And based on database, meaning we know exactly what a person's brain ought to look like at all 88 levels, 88 sections, they're called Broadman areas. And the database, gives us the information for every six months of life from the ages of two to 82. Do you have maybe an example that you could give of helping a patient to zero in on the correct brain activity given how far off they are versus the normal range within this database? There's actually, because so many people have concentration problems with just with reading, especially kids, and we're constantly training kids to get their brain waves moving quicker when they're reading. The patient that I'm seeing, he got Lyme's disease really bad about 20 years ago and it got into his heart and his brain and it's really disabled him. He's on full disability and he has trouble reading and he's doing neurofeedback. He's doing really well with neurofeedback. It's really interesting how it happened. He was stuck at a certain threshold. You see, with neurofeedback, you're trying to move the threshold down. We do something called Z-score training, which relies on good old statistics. Using the database, we know in all 88 Brahmin areas what a person's brain ought to look like. And when it's deviant in any way, say something is two standard deviations off the mean, that means that it's in the top 5% or bottom 5%. If it's three standard deviations off the mean, it's 99.9 or one out of a thousand. So he was actually at four and a half standard deviations off the mean in critical areas of his brain. And all of a sudden in one session about two weeks ago, and this is a person who comes twice a week, he just kind of got it and he couldn't explain it. But he just started advancing very quickly. It was like the neurons restitched themselves. And believe it or not, after being stuck at four and a half standard deviations, he's now down around one and a quarter standard deviations off the mean. You know the feeling you get when you're, let's say you're having trouble falling asleep. And then you say to yourself, oh, good, I'm falling asleep. And you can feel yourself being aware of it right before you drop off. You can also prevent yourself from falling asleep up to a point. If you're on the subway or train and you don't want to fall asleep, you can say, well, wait a minute. I don't want to miss my train. I don't want to miss my stop. So you pull yourself out of it. It's a very interesting process. Well, that's kind of what neurofeedback is. You can't make it happen. You have to let it happen, but you can prevent it from happening also. 
And, and for example, I've been doing it long enough on myself to know what it feels like when I'm doing well. And it's a familiar feeling to me when I've done it that day. It always reminds me of, you know that feeling you get when you've been driving a car for a long time and you pull in for gas, not realizing how dirty your windshield is, and the guy cleans your windshield and you go, oh my God, look how clear the world is. I had no idea. That's kind of what neurofeedback feels like. Everything is clearer. You're more relaxed, but you're more alert. You're centered. I'd love to go back to something you said about standard deviations there. Maybe this ties in with the word centered too. Cooked into that is the implication that most of our brainwave states, the population is going to fall into these bell-shaped curves, these normal distribution curves of how one person's brain versus the next would be. Does that bear out in the population? Do these things fit themselves nicely into normal curves? Yeah, that's exactly what the database, the principle is made out of. The foundation of it is the bell curve. And the acceptable rate is two standard deviations off the mean. So you see that in statistics all the time. Probability is less than 0.05 or 1 in 20. In peer-reviewed research journals, that's the acceptable rate of the chances occurring by luck, 1 out of 20. That's what a 0.05 means. So it's the same thing with brain waves. Now, this guy was four and a half standard deviations off the mean in critical areas required for reading. And now he's 1.25. And it just happened all of a sudden. It was the strangest thing. He just kind of did it. Unfortunately, it hasn't generalized as well as I would like it to. His reading has gotten much better, but not as advanced as I would hope it was based on these numbers. Sometimes people say when they argue you against neurofeedback, you're making people mediocre. Because if you make people average, what about somebody with 130 IQ? And why are you going to bring them down to 100? Well, it's an argument I hear quite a bit. But in my experience, it's kind of like multiple personalities, Jesse. You hear about multiple personalities, but I've never met a psychologist, including myself, who ever met a patient who was a true multiple personality. Filmmakers like them a lot more than reality seems to. Exactly. It makes for great television. But in the real world, it just rarely exists. And also, I think it's a different case when somebody comes in that's clearly debilitated, you know, in this case, Lyme's disease, reading problems, probably pushing them towards the normal is going to be advantageous for somebody like that. The fact is, I've never seen it make someone dumber. Well, blood pressure, we know 120 over 80 is the norm. Now, one day that may change. It may decide 110 over 70 is more desirable, but that's considered lower blood pressure right now. You were talking early on about some of the the catch-22s of somebody dealing with social anxiety disorder, and one of those being that the barrier of actually reaching out to somebody, even if that somebody is a psychologist, to deal with social anxiety, that barrier itself might seem insurmountable. It seems like maybe virtual reality could even be used to solve some of those problems, sort of the onboarding process, dealing with virtual chatbots or or virtual receptionists rather than a real person. Exactly, exactly. And so if we can do that, if we can at least engage that population who is so fearful of coming forward, because of this face-to-face interaction that they are genuinely fearing. If we can do that, either through successfully treating them through this exposure therapy simply in the virtual reality environment or using that as a bridge between not getting treatment and actually being able to come in for an assessment and potentially get treatment, then at the end of the day, uh, us researchers are heading home very, very happy. How common is this really? What percentage of the population deals with a diagnosable level of social anxiety? In terms of lifetime prevalence, because there's different types of prevalence we can look at, but in terms of over the course of one's lifetime, anyone from a Western society, the rates are very, very high. It's the third most common psychiatric disorder in the U.S., for instance, and it affects about 7 to 13 percent. So very, very high rates of social anxiety disorder. And so a student survey has found from one group of researchers that 90% would rather do virtual reality than in vivo exposure therapy, which means kind of real life exposure therapy. We can minimize the social threat. We can avoid things like overexposure. We can allow the patient greater control of their own environment. And of course, it doesn't necessitate this feared face-to-face contact with therapists. And finally, we actually found that it's just as clinically effective as CBT at times, but actually it's a lot more cost-effective. The thing that we actually have in place right now 
is an app. We have an app developed that you can put on any smartphone. You can buy the headset, something like Google Cardboard costs, I believe, eight pounds or in the US, maybe $12 or so. And basically, it's a very, very portable thing. So you could do it anytime, any place. And yeah, and basically receive even treatment on the go if you're keen to do that. Has there ever been any concerted attempt to maybe build a database of very high performing brains and see where maybe the standards there are a little bit different from the mean of the general population? Not to my knowledge, but that's a great idea. We have some ideas about what that would take. For example, we know that being able to shift from one state to another is very important. Let's say you're deeply relaxed. Well, if you can rev up very quickly to very alert, a desired kind of thing. You can see where something like that would come in handy in the real world. I mean, the real world applications of being able to go from a creative state to a highly focused state quickly when you decide on the right solution to your problem, that kind of thing could come in very handy. They say that when people have had amazing ideas, it's been like a storm in their mind. Apparently when Einstein, I read his biography, he was about to give up on general relativity until it just came to him. The concept of things slowing down as they got faster. I mean, this was 1910, I think, that he thought about this. There was a storm in his mind for weeks as he got the formulas down. And then his wife checked all the mathematics and then he got drunk for a week. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Drs. Robert Reiner and Eva Zisk for taking the time for those conversations. I think right now is really an interesting time in the development of these technologies and their usefulness and how therapists are having to adjust to this quickly shifting landscape. Right now, virtual reality worlds have a different social feel to them than they might in five, ten years from now when these things are even more common. And the idea that you are really alone when you're in a virtual space might be somewhat diminished. We might be dealing with one another in virtual reality avatar situations where just because another person looks like Max Headroom doesn't necessarily mean that we don't ascribe consciousness to being behind those eyes. Or conversely, as AI gets better, our relationship with our robots and artificial intelligence software agents, things like that might change. Right now, I think nothing of walking around naked in front of my Roomba, but if I attributed consciousness to it, that might be different. So it's interesting to think about not just where we are now, but where we might be in the near future. Which of these technologies is here for the long haul and which might be more of a flash in the pan, like Laserdisc technology before DVDs or or really even DVDs before streaming video. Consider the email basket open if you've got ideas for other technologies you'd like us to talk about on this show. The encroachment of technology on our brains is certainly not going to be getting smaller anytime soon. But moving along from virtual reality humans to real live elephants, let's jump to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So there are a lot of aspects worth discussing when it comes to elephant brains. Elephants never forget is a fairly famous saying. Not exactly true, but they have been shown to have good long-term memories. They also have the largest brain of any land animal. An elephant's brain is substantially larger than a human's, although proportionally we have a much larger brain given our body mass than an elephant. But diverging from elephants for just a moment, if you've got any pets, you might have noticed that they tend to sleep a lot. This isn't just because pets are lazy and we do all their work for them. There also seems to be a general truism among mammals that the smaller an animal is, the more percentage of the day it sleeps. Humans are pretty big as mammals go, and we sleep comparatively little when you look at other animals. So scientists were wondering, does this trend continue to scale? Does the African elephant, the biggest land mammal, sleep even less than a human does? In zoos, this seems to be the case. Zookeepers have noted that their elephants seem to sleep on average about four hours a day, but the behavior of an animal in a zoo isn't necessarily representative of what their wild cousins might do. So a team of scientists working in conjunction from the University of Southern California at Los Angeles and the University of Witzwatersrands, which is a fun name to say, got together, tracked down some wild elephants, and outfitted them with the equivalent of an elephant Fitbit that could track their daily activity as they went about their elephant lifestyle. Rather than putting these Fitbit-like trackers on the elephant's wrist or the wrist equivalent, they actually thought it would be better to put them on the elephant's trunk. As Professor Paul Manger explained, We reasoned that measuring the activity of the trunk, the most mobile and active appendage of the elephant, would be crucial in making the reasonable assumption that if the trunk is still for five minutes or more, the elephant is likely to be asleep. So working with the NGO Elephants Without Borders, they set up two matriarch elephants living in the Chobe National Park in Botswana, and then they engaged in some well-intentioned cyber stalking for a period of months. So the big finding of the study is that, yes, the general truism holds, elephants really don't sleep very much. They slept on average only two hours a night. On nights when they got less than two hours of sleep, there did not seem to be a bounce back effect. They weren't super tired the next day or anything like that. 
The time that the elephants sleep was often deep in the night, way before dawn, but also way after sundown, making elephants both night owls and early birds. And the scientists' data indicated that environmental conditions like temperature and humidity rather than sunlight were what regulated when the animals probably chose to go to sleep, says Manger. This finding is the first that indicates that sleep in wild animals is likely to not be related to sunrise and sunset, but that other environmental factors are more crucial to the timing of sleep. Now, elephants can sleep both standing up and lying down, and they tend to sleep standing up quite a bit more, oftentimes only lying down to sleep once every few days. However, there were some differences when they did. It seemed that they only went into REM sleep when they were lying down, not standing up. This is interesting because some studies have indicated that REM sleep is really important for memory consolidation, but this does not seem to be the case with elephants, says Manger. Our findings are not consistent with this hypothesis of the function for REM sleep, as the elephant has well-documented long-term memories but does not need REM sleep every day to form these memories. Finally, if you're like me and you can remember times when you'd be living with roommates in college and your roommates would be partying in the other room while you were trying to sleep and you needed to go somewhere else entirely so you could get any sleep, elephants have similar problems sometimes and they are very good at dealing with it. When these two tracked elephants were disturbed by things such as predators, poachers, or bull elephants in a must, which is what they call it when you are a horny bull elephant, these matriarch elephants could go without sleep for up to 48 hours and after having their sleep disturbed, they would walk away up to 30 kilometers from wherever the disturbance happened. As for why studies like this are useful, the researchers cite the benefits both to elephants and to humans. First, it helps us to better understand the animals themselves and discover new information that may lead to better management and conservation strategies. And secondly, knowing how different animals sleep and why they do so in their own particular way helps us to better understand how humans sleep, why we do, and how we might get a better night's sleep. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us smart drug smarts. Okay, so that was everything for episode number 178. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find the links to everything that we talked about up at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 178. And if you missed it last week, I spoke with Dr. Steven Ziesel about the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and choline, its dietary precursor. And next week in 179, I'm not exactly sure what it's going to be yet. We've got a couple of vying contenders, but we'll do either a coin toss or something more scientific in the next couple of days here. Keep you guessing on that one, but see you next Friday when I will be back at you as usual, same time, same podcast, and with that same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.